Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today for the Acoustical Considerations for Terminal Unit Selections webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical aspects. As you know, the audio is being broadcast through your internet. However, if you experience any problems, please call in using the number provided on the screen. We also encourage everyone to go ahead and submit questions to all panelists anytime using your chat or your question function on the WebEx toolbar. These questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Now to introduce you to our presenters. Today we're going to have Jerry Seitz. He is the Vice President of Engineering at Price Industries. Jerry has more than 20 years of experience in the HVAC field, and he currently serves on the national level of ASHRAE, AHRI, and USGBC. He is the Vice Chair for ASHRAE Technical Committee 53 for Room Air Distribution. Also joining us today is going to be Patrick Oliver. Patrick is an Applications Engineer, and he is our resident noise guru here at Price Industries. Patrick is involved with product design, lab testing, and supporting custom applications. He is, actively, he is active in industry organizations and is a chair at ASHRAE Technical Committee 2-6 for sound and vibration control. We're also going to have Matthew Conrad today. He's an applications engineer at Price Industries. He has his Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. He has four years of laboratory experience along with product design and testing. I now like to pass over the the presentation to all of I'm uh, sorry to Patrick. Thank you. Uh, so just briefly talking a little bit about what we're going to be covering today. Uh, it, I will be introducing uh, some of the changes that have gone on in AHRI 880 in the in the recent revision of the of the rating standard. Uh, then Matthew will be going over some of the terminal selection guidelines, so going over some of the, the key parameters that affect the overall acoustic performance of various terminal units. And then Jerry will be providing a few more guidelines and practical tips on installing and, and selecting these and providing a, a detailed example uh, showing the application of a different, uh, different terminal units in specific spaces and scenarios. So, Basically, when we're, we're looking at what's changed in AHRI 880, so this is the rating standard for terminal units, uh, there has basically been two major changes to the, the, the document, uh, specifically how the sound measurements are done and how those measurements are reported and, and um, cataloged in publications. So basically, if we're looking at the AHRI 880 document, it's a ratings document, so it specifies the operating points and conditions that the units are tested under for these uh, specific publications. However, it references ASHRAE 130 for the method of test, so that's referencing how the, the actual units are configured, the laboratory conditions that are required and, and equipment that is required, whereas, and the sound measurements are measured in accordance with AHRI 220. And 220 provides guidance as to the actual conditions for the reverberation chamber, so how the microphones are located, how many, um, what type of microphone, and the, an the uh, frequency analyzer that is used, as well as the, me the range over which the measurements are taken. Uh, and then I will also be talking a little bit more later on about how the, the impact of that uh, duct end correction. So historically, measurements have been done using octave band values. So this is basically breaking up the frequency range into specific uh, frequency sub-ranges so that we get a little bit better picture of what's going on over the frequency spectrum. Now, the human hearing occurs over a much wider range. However, historic, we've found that terminal units specifically are predominantly uh, due to the nature of the sound generated by these devices, the sound typically occurs in the range between 125 and 4,000 hertz. So now, if we're looking at changing how we record these values, we're looking at basically taking three times as many measurements. So for each octave band, there are three sub-bands that are recorded. 
Now, this basically triples the number of values, but it gives a much more detailed uh, picture of, of the sound spectrum, specifically it allowing us to identify if the presence of tones uh, or different, uh, different, different effects from the airflow through the device. Uh, so effectively, this, is a, this change is, really has a very negligible impact to the end user and to the, to the catalog values. Basically, we are in the laboratory are recording three times as many numbers. Um, however, with the use of spreadsheets and, and modern analyzers, this really it doesn't affect the actual workload and, and just provides a lot more information to use. So when we combine these third octave bands, we end up with the exact same octave band value that would have been measured using the historical uh, octave band filters. Specifically, the end reflection has a much more significant impact on our cataloged and published data. End reflection is basically the, the phenomenon when acoustic energy is reflected back into the duct at an abrupt termination. So in the animation, we see uh, basically a string of two different masses. So, so the initial string is, is traveling along and, or the disturbance in the string is traveling along and it has a specific speed, specific displacement, and it really depends on, on the environment that it's traveling in. Now when it reaches a change in the mass of the, of the medium, then some of that energy is transmitted, is reflected back, and this is referred to as an impedance mismatch. Now this all occurs in ductwork where the, the sound energy is traveling along the ductwork in a constrained environment, and then as soon as it hits a, a free field, some of that sound energy is reflected back into the ductwork, and so this needs to be taken into, into account. Uh, end reflection is not a new phenomenon. It's been known of for, for quite some time, and, and it really is evident in the design of several different musical instruments and uh, devices that re reproduce sound. Um, most people are familiar that the, the diameter of a subwoofer affects the, the frequency with which it, the lower frequency that it can get down to. Uh, the same as a, the design of a tuba, we have a very gradually expanding evasé or, or exit condition so that that acoustic energy is emitted efficiently and not reflected back into the ductwork. And so that we can see this is really a, a low frequency phenomenon. So for instance, in the design of the flute, uh, the, which is a much higher frequency instrument, the, the low frequency reflection of that at, at the end uh, at the end or the termination of the of the air passage does not affect the actual emission of the sound that we're wanting from that specific uh, instrument. And so this this phenomenon has been well researched uh, through an ASHRAE funded research project 1314 which really examined some, several different configurations of uh, duct terminations and validated a lot of the end reflection values in the applications handbook. Uh, it investigated different duct termination conditions and, and really provided a good understanding of what's going on. And so here we see our validated values from the ASHRAE application handbook and we can see that for very small duct diameters, the end reflection loss can be very substantial. As the duct diameters get larger, then the values become less and less prominent. However, for those smaller ducts, it becomes a, it's a very significant uh, value and number. So basically, when we're publishing our, our end reflection or our, our ducted discharge for a terminal unit, we're really we need to incorporate that acoustic energy that is being reflected back into the ductwork, so that when we do a, an actual analysis and do a selection for a specific project, we have the actual acoustic energy and we can t properly account for that that acoustic energy that has been reflected back in the duct, and that, which may not happen in the actual installed conditions. So this is the updated equation that it was developed from the ASHRAE funded research project, and so this is now being applied to all of our ducted um, or our discharge sound power levels for all terminal units. And so if we can take a look at the overall sound spectrum for a specific unit, Basically, what we've been measuring previously was the acoustic energy within the reverb room, uh, which is the blue line, and our updated values to include that end reflection correction or loss 
are shown in red. So really we're seeing a significant change in the very low frequency sound for that, those specific units. And so all of the published data and uh, submitted software to AHRI is to be updated, was to be updated by January 1st of 2012. However, mo many manufacturers have not, some manufacturers have not updated their publications, so, so they have until the end of this year to get revised information out. But basically, just taking a look at some of the representative different sizes and the impact on our overall NC level that would be calculated based on the standard AHRI 885 deductions from Appendix E. So taking those sound power levels across the, the full octave band range, applying estimates of typical scenarios where those sound uh, with attenuation values for typical scenarios and determining an overall NC level. We can see that the NC values for the smaller units has been significantly uh, changed. Uh, larger units, there's a much more minor or much smaller effect on the, uh, on the overall NC levels. However, for small units, it can be quite substantial. Now, it's not to say that the actual terminal unit is louder. It's really an changing the published values to reflect the measured conditions. However, the, the actual unit itself is not louder. So if you've had issues or have not had issues before with a specific selection, it doesn't mean you will all of a sudden have a much louder unit. The unit's um, sound power levels have not changed. It's just the, the published values are updated to reflect this end reflection. So in conclusion for my section, we basically need to make sure that when we're comparing performance between different uh, manufacturers, it's important to make sure that those values are an apples-to-apples -apples comparison where you're testing uh, discharge sound power levels that have the end reflection loss in included. So anything uh, published in accordance with the AHRI standard 880 version of 2011 would have that end reflection correction uh, applied. However, it m published values may not reflect that, and so you need to be very careful to make sure that you have a fair comparison between uh, different units from different manufacturers. And so with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Matthew, who will go over some of the selection guidelines for uh, determining which terminal unit to use for your specific project. All right, thank you. Um, so today, I'll be talking about terminal selection guidelines. And um, for this talk, we will primarily focus on the acoustical aspects. There are uh, many factors to consider with terminal unit selection, but today we're just going to focus on the acoustics. And for the terminal units that we will look for, uh, for examples, are going to be single duct boxes and constant volume fan powered terminal units. The following factors that we'll consider and their influence on acoustics are flow rate, differential pressure, unit size, liner type, and sound attenuation or sound attenuator silencers. All right, so for a terminal unit, um, in its simplest form, it's just simply a device used for regulating airflow. And the simplest terminal unit that we can uh, implement is the single duct box. And this is basically just a damper that we can open and close uh, to allow more air or less air to pass through the, de the device. And to fully specify the operating conditions of a terminal unit, we need to know the airflow range that we need to uh, achieve, and as well as the differential pressure that we're going to have across the terminal unit. And so uh, just to clarify what I mean by differential pressure, that is the change in static pressure that occurs as um, the air passes through the terminal unit. This should not be confused with the differential pressure measured on the flow sensor, which is looking at the total pressure versus the static pressure right at the entrance point of the terminal unit itself 
and taking that difference to get our velocity pressure and calculate a flow rate. So the first aspect that we will look at is uh, flow rate and what happens uh, with the sound as we increase our flow rate. Naturally, as we introduce more air through a terminal unit, the sound will increase due to higher velocities and turbulence, etc. And so for a standard uh, single duct box, the increase uh, with about 1,000 CFM in a size 12 box is going to be 5 MC. And so if we are concerned with how, if, if we're concerned with the discharge sound, one thing we can do is add an integrally connected discharge attenuator that's characterized as a unit and get test results that lower our NC values by uh, up to five and more potentially on your application. All right, and so the next type of terminal unit is the fan-powered constant volume. And what happens here is we add two levels of complexity to the uh, airflow regulation. We incorporate a return air attenuator to draw in air from the plenum or from a ducted return. And we add a fan so that we can keep a constant discharge airflow even if we turn down the airflow from our primary air source. And so, for example, if we were wanting to maintain 1,000 CFM through the discharge air, our primary could turn down to 500, and then the return air would be 500 CFM as well. And so the trends for flow rates with constant volume fan power boxes uh, are shown here for discharge and radiated sound. And from this, we can see that if we increase our about 1,000 CFM for the standard type of unit, we get an increase of tendency. And so if we're concerned for uh, radiated sound, we could add a, a return attenuator onto that entry point of the return air, and we can get uh, about 8 NC savings. And if we're concerned with discharge NC levels, uh, we can incorporate a, uh, a discharge attenuator, and that will have little impact on the radiated sound, but we can gain about 14 NC uh, reduction on the discharge sound. The next factor we'll consider is differential pressure. And as I've said before, simply specifying the flow rate isn't enough to specify the operating conditions of a terminal unit. Uh, we also need to specify the differential pressure. And this uh, correlates to the valve position. If we close the valve more and more, our static pressure or our differential pressure will increase. And so the effects or the trends are shown on the graphs below for radiated and dis discharged sound. And we can see that as we close the valve and increase our static pressure, um, the sound levels across all frequency bands are increased. Uh, and so a less, having a lower static pressure would be ideal if you're concerned about sound. Um, and the reason that the static pressure increase causes an increased sound is that we reduce the amount of free area that the airflow has to pass through the damper. This creates higher velocities and turbulence and consequently a louder sound. And so to get an idea of how um, differential pressure affects the NC level, what we can see here for single duct boxes is that a one inch of water column, the two inch increase, results in an increase of 10 NC for the standard single duct terminal unit. Uh, if we incorporate a discharge silencer, this will cause a 5 NC increase. When we look at fan power devices, we see that the uh, differential pressure does not have as an extreme of an effect 
on the sound that's generated. Uh, and this can be attributed to the fact that the fan is the primary source of sound and not the damper position. Uh, it's going to sort of drown out the noise from the damper. Another factor to consider, uh, in addition to operating conditions, are the size of the terminal unit itself. And so, uh, when, typically when we size terminal units, we look at the maximum airflow, and um, and then we say, okay, we want to have an ideal range for that particular flow rate. But we also need to concern ourselves with turn down. Uh, so for this example, I've selected a 50% turn down. So our flow rate range will be 600 to 1200 CFM. Uh, and what we can see by looking at this chart is that a size 10 through size 16 would all accomplish the same, uh, could all be used to maintain the proper flow rate. Um, however, if we look at the size 16, the flow rates there range from, that we can achieve with the 16 size box is from 600 all the way up to 4,000. So we're not utilizing the entire range of our damper position to regulate the flow. Uh, the flow or the damper will be closed more so than it would be for, say, the size 10 unit. And this can lead to uh, stability issues because when the valve is nearly closed and we crack it open just a little bit, uh, we'll get a more significant change in flow rates and this can lead to hunting and never actually being at the desired flow rate. Um, tip, and also one thing to mention is that I've selected this for a 50% turndown. 30% is, uh, say, more typical for the turndown. And this would exclude um, the size 16 and the size 14 units. Uh, so the turndown flow rate would be about 360 CFM. So, but the question would be, uh, what do we, uh, what would we want to choose for sound? Uh, and so here shows an example um, that often leads to uh, people wanting to oversize their boxes in order to reduce the amount of sound generated. This shows that the size 10 um, is 5 NC louder at a similar static pressure compared to the size 16. But as I said before, since we're not utilizing the full range of the size 16 box, we will have stability issues. Uh, so one option would be to appropriately size your terminal unit for the desired flow rate range, and then consider incorporating a silencer to uh, reduce down your 5 NC and get you back to where you would like to be as if you were using the size 16 box, except now you have uh, better control of your system. And this is not to mention that e oversizing doesn't always work. And here, uh, this table shows an example of this. Uh, if for some reason we were operating at three inches of water column and 800 CFM, we could see that a size eight to nine, we get that reduced NC value, but if we increase from 10 to 12, our noise will actually increase. And so this is due to the valve being too closed and having stability issues. So oversizing the box is not always um, the best solution. We also must consider the effect of static pressure and stability. So in addition to unit size and operating conditions, Liner types can also have a significant influence on the sound that we get from a terminal unit. And so what we can see from this here, or single duct boxes, is that fiberglass has the best performance uh, for discharge sound, but um, if we were concerned with radiated sound, we would need to go with uh, solid metal. And this is due to the fact that an additional layer of metal is more mass for the sound to 
uh, break out of and uh, more sound could be uh, reflected downstream instead. However, this effect uh, does not, or this trend does not follow for fan-powered terminal units. Um, what we can see here is that fiberglass actually performs the best for radiated and discharged sound. Uh, and this, and in fact, solid metal performs the worst for radiated sound. And this is due to the fact that on a constant volume fan power terminal unit, we have a return air opening. And so all the sound that was being reflected off of the hard metal surface is now finding its way out of the return air opening and into your occupied space. Um, and so, but we can also note that uh, maybe the liner type doesn't have as strong of an influence on the discharge sound for fan-powered device. So the last thing that we will look at is um, adding a silencer to a terminal unit and whether or not this will actually make the system quieter. When we're incorporating silencers into our system, we need to consider the separation distance. Um, if we place our silencer too close to the terminal unit, we can get close coupling effects where the flow has not become uniform after passing past the turbulent damper condition. So we get turbulent airflow, and then this turbulent airflow can encounter the silencer and get unanticipated results. So on this graph here, we look at um, the effects that placing a silencer in the system has uh, with the, and the distance away from the terminal unit. So we can see that if we were to close couple our silencer and have no separation distance from our base unit, our second octave band actually increases. And quite often, this is the primary band that limits our NC level inside the space. If this wasn't the uh, primary source of sound concern, we see that we would still get some attenuation from uh, in the other octave bands. And it's not until we get to about three diameters until we approach the uh, quote-unquote theoretical values. Um, we can see that after we go past three diameters to four diameters, the influence or the effect does not have as significant of an effect um, as if we were to go below three diameters. And so if we needed to have the silencer closer than three diameters, we would recommend considering a integrated discharge silencer terminal unit in order to get the characterized results specifically and not have to uh, uh, combine results and get unanticipated outcomes. And so this concludes my discussion of terminal unit selection. I will now pass over the talk to Jerry Sipes. Good afternoon. So when we talk about terminal units, usually uh, the question comes up, how can I make a selection that makes it uh, meet my sound requirements? So we've discussed a lot of the changes in the current standards and and uh, through the uh, description of what happens when you change liners and such. So let's actually take a look at actually selecting a product for a sound sensitive space, such as a you know, single occupancy office, conference room, performance spaces, and so forth. And the reality is, as you go down that list, they get more complicated. And as you go toward the performance spaces, you may end up with actually having an acoustician whom we have on staff and will be more than willing to put you in contact with. So don't forget, we do have that resource available. Now, when I'm looking at a design goal of an ideal space, I have some guidelines, and ASHRAE gives the uh, most commonly referred to guidelines. And typically, you know, private office, uh, maybe NC25, and then performance centers, they list as 25 or less. And most of them I see is uh, around NC10 as a requirement. And when you get down to that level of uh, acoustical, you'll be doing different treatments to uh, the products, and that's when we would definitely want you to talk to one of our uh, sound gurus, such as Patrick. So when I look at NC guidance, you have to understand that the NC value they're talking about is what you want in the room, but 
when you do a selection for software, it's theoretical. And the difference is that um, NC conversion from sound power levels requires the attenuation factors for the space in question. But the process that we use to catalog this data is using uh, predetermined theoretical space as outlined in AHRI's standard 885, Appendix E. So that means that there's some differences in the uh, actual application of the product as to what you can get. Now, combining that with the fact that we have uh, this sound and reflection component that has been missing for years, when I when I ask engineers, let's say you're designing a space for NC25, what, what do you pick the product set? Oftentimes I get told 15 to 17 NC. We all learn our, our lessons from previous problems, and usually we under-select the sound in order to meet the goal, because installation does have an impact as well. Now, perhaps when uh, the end reflection is fully reflected in all manufacturers' data, you may find yourself actually being able to select closer to NC20 or so for my actual products to reach your goal of NC25. So this is something you uh, may want to evaluate. The sound quality is also something not described by the NC guidance, so we definitely want to take a look at the frequency assumptions. And then, and again, if necessary, we'll do a full acoustical analysis. So the process I normally use is I start with what is the source? The terminal, diffuser, equipment, um, could be, I don't know, air handling equipment in a different space. There's a lot of options here that may impact you. So I would look at the space path the sound has to take to get into said space. And AHRI standard 885 has predetermined several sound paths, and I'll discuss those shortly. And once I've determined the attenuation factors I need for my actual design, I will then use them to uh, give me the sound power, sound pressure levels, the octave, and then I would use that to estimate my sound and C values in my space. And if you would like, um, I encourage you to obtain a copy of AHRI Standard 885. It's available on ahrinet.orgs, and it's free. So the four steps that we normally look at for octave band selection are one, what is my power that I have to dissipate? And usually this comes from either a catalog selection or preferably software because catalog has a finite number of uh, incremental data, and selection program can actually give you exactly the values you're looking for. Our all-in-one selection software is a great tool for that, for terminals. Now, once I know what type of product I'm using, um, I just need to put in the appropriate acoustical model. Now, AHRI has developed four of them. I'm only going to talk about two. Um, I'll discuss those on the next slide. And once I know the path, I need to go to AHRI Standard 885 Appendix D to come up with my attenuation factors. Then I add them logarithmically and convert this to uh, an NC. Now, all of these four steps can actually be completed inside our software. And I'll show you a couple of screenshots of that. I encourage you to consider this because it's one-stop shopping. And of course, if you do need to have a more complete analysis, we do the acoustical lay-in services. On the models, well, there are the two that I will discuss is either fan-powered or single duct. Now, the other two that are available is integrated diffuser terminal and then a generic one that you can apply for any type of pass. Um, I make a, a note here that when we talk about chilled beams, they're oftentimes referred to as an induction terminal. They would not be part of the first model. They would be part of the integrated diffuser terminal as the chill beam is applied room side, not in the plenum cavity. So, let's take a look at these models. <clears throat> the first fan powered or induction terminal unit um, simply differs from the other uh, single duct unit in that it has an opening for the induction of uh, either return air or room air, and this is used for free reheat. Now, when I look at this return air opening, that's a significant amount of potential for radiant sound to escape from the housing. And being as we have a fan and a valve inside that enclosure, to 
depending upon your static pressure of your inlet that you're dissipating and how hard the fan is working to provide the air, you have varying levels of, of radiated and discharge sound. Liner has an incredible impact on fan powered and induction terminals as that opening does not really attenuate radiated sound very effectively. And as I go toward a harder lining, I have more and more sound escaping. Um, impacting this is the geometry of the box, its footprint, and its height. And also the treatment for this return or opening, if it has an attenuator or a silencer and so forth. Now, normally when I'm designing for a fan paired box, I would just automatically go with the assumption that radiated sound is my dominant sound source that I have to control. Bear in mind that all I have between the occupant and the uh, source of sound is hopefully space and a ceiling. And unfortunately, in today's design, ceilings sometimes are options. So you need to look at that a little bit closely, too. Now, in this, you see that we have uh, breakout sound from the ductwork. <clears throat> if I were trying to control it to cut down on the radius sound coming from that, one way is minimizing the velocity of air going through it. The other is to change the geometry of the duct. If I go to a round duct, I have less radiated sound breaking out. Now, caveat is that if I capture that radiated sound, it has to go somewhere else, and that'll end up either coming out of the terminal unit or out of the diffuser. So this is one of those design options you may have to evaluate. If I look, oops. <clears throat> if I look at the single duct unit, it has significantly less radiated sound. Now, normally, discharge sound is the dominant source of uh, sound inside spaces, and this is really true when we're talking about solid metal liners. So there's the difference there. <clears throat> when I'm doing selection guidance, oftentimes we talk about how they're installed inside of a space. The easiest rule to minimize the sound reaching an occupant is to place the terminal as far away from the occupant as possible. Once you've selected a quiet box, the further away you put it, the less the occupant will perceive that sound to be. Now, that means I'm getting closer and closer to structural elements. I do not want to attach a fan box to a structural element directly because this will allow any vibration on the fan to transmit to structure and it may be retransmitted in a different frequency and cause new issues in different locations of the building. So oftentimes we either have vibration absorbers or a strap holding it up that tends to dissipate the sound. On the same line of thought, we don't want to direct couple ductwork to a terminal unit that has a fan we want to use some sort of flexible skirt or something to allow this uh, transmitted vibration to simply stay inside the terminal unit itself. Now, we have an assumption inside of the 885 Appendix E data in that we have a liner, five feet of line ductwork. Oftentimes, we find this is being removed because of the perceived issues with fiberglass liner. Um, the other thing that we also have in this acoustical model is uh, five feet of flex duct. Now, when we look at flex duct, there's two ways of looking at it. If, if I'm looking at it from a diffuser's point of view, it has a tendency to generate some turbulence, which tends to be a higher frequency sound. Gratefully, that's going to dissipate fairly quickly. If I look at it from a terminal unit, um, any low frequency sound that's inside the ductwork has a, a very good chance of breaking out through the flex duct and into the cavity above the ceiling and not near an occupant. So I always look at having some sort of flex duct inside my system to help minimize the potential for low frequency sound. So let, let's take a look at this model. <clears throat> In the uh, software that we have, our quick selector terminal units, we have um, the ability to build your own attenuation factors for your ideal space. Now, again, we use the 885 Appendix E mineral fiber uh, ceiling data, and that's reflected here. And you see there's three tabs, one for 300 CFM or less, 300 to 700, and then greater than 700. The reason for these divisions is the ductwork size changes. Also, the number of outlets also changes. Um, this is just, of course, simply a, a guidance type calculation. Now, you can see in the data, the first item is lining reduction you can see that we have, for this case, standard fiberglass liner, um, one inch thick, five feet of length, and I'm attenuating two dB in the second band all the way up to 12 dB in the seventh. Fiberglass, is, in any liner, frankly, is, is very good at attenuating higher frequency sounds, maybe moderately effective at the lower frequencies. 
but removing the liner automatically adds this higher level sound back inside my discharge sound and can easily lead to uh, uh, white noise inside my space. Now the other thing you'll see that the important factor is that flux duct reduction. And you can see it's uh, eight inch flux duct, three taps, that's 300 CFM per diffuser basically. And I have six dB in the second band all the way up to 12 in the seventh, 21 in the sixth. So if I take out my flex duct, I have a chance of significant amounts of lower energy sound and mid-band sound coming out my diffusers. The room attenuation itself is fairly decent, and that is based on an assumption of 2,400 cubic foot room with the occupant five feet away, which more than likely is not really your building design. So I understand this is the limitations of the AHRI 885 Appendix E data. Now, on the radiated sound, it's a little clearer that we really have an impact with the ceiling. Basically, between the occupant and that uh, sound source, that terminal, all we have is hopefully a ceiling that's continuous, not a cloud. If we do have a cloud ceiling, we can work that out. Um, we'll have to do a custom analysis, though, because it's not part of the 885 standard at this time. And you can see that without a ceiling, we have a lot more energy that potentially reaches the space from the terminal unit through direct radiation. So the ceiling does a great deal of attenuation. If I wanted to be very, very conservative, I would take the ceiling type out of this for radiated math in my software. That would be very conservative, typically. So on the guidelines, let's just give some general rules. I, I try to use, if, if I'm less than one and a half CFM a square foot of air supply, I select the radiated sound on a terminal of five points less than my design goal. All right. Now, this is taking into account the fact that in reflections now accounted for inside my uh, my uh, data, and that uh, also I have uh, some variance for installation effect itself. Another way of minimizing my my sound is to limit the inlet velocities in my ductwork to the terminal to less than 1,500 feet per minute. Now, this is a good number in that lower than this doesn't really lead to quieter units, but larger than this may, depending upon the duct geometry and whether you have elbows or not prior to the terminal unit. Another thing is that if I select 1,500 feet per minute, typically I can meet my minimum turndowns of 30 to 15 percent with little or minimal issue. For instance, on that slide that, that Matt talked about earlier, that is 1,200 CFM the 12 inch unit would be able to meet both the 30 and the 15 percent turndown range, so it's a very flexible approach this way. If I go to select it, say, at 1,000 feet per minute, I may end up with a terminal unit selection, maybe a size 10 or 8, and I cannot meet my flow signal pickup for the lower flow rates with any degree of accuracy. Now, this is actually being addressed right now in ASHRAE Standard 195, which is a great document. It's, it's a, a methodology of taking a terminal unit flow sensor and matching it with the commonly available controls on the market because as each vendor provides the controls, the pressure signal is measured by different types of devices with different levels of accuracy and there's some uncertainty inside this. So generally, we try to size it so that we have an inlet for the minimum turndown velocity of around 250 to 300 feet per minute at a minimum. In the selection component, where I'm putting in the building probably is the thing. Higher statics automatically lead to sound issues as far as I'm concerned. And frankly, higher statics leads to over energy consumption in my main system because that's brake horsepower coming back due to that, that dissipation of static. But uh, generally, if I have a room that's NC45 or higher, I can place the terminal unit over the room. If if uh, I have less than 45, then depending upon the size of the unit, we may or may not have issues. So if I have a room design of 30 NC or less, I would not normally start with placing a fan pair terminal unit over this space. Um, what I would do is first look at the terminal unit and then try to decide whether to fit or not. But this first rule is to put it over a space without somebody sitting there, a particular person with your phone number. Now, if I'm designing a space with NC40 or less, then I can I can often use a fan-powered box, but it most likely would not be a standard fan-powered box. The closer I get to NC30, I would probably end up with an acoustical treatment of some sort. The general rule is just try to put a terminal unit away from the occupant 
and as high as possible in the plenum space should you actually have plenum space. The uh, inlet ductwork should be <coughs> at least three diameters in length. This is a common talky point that uh, I've heard for over 25 years. And oftentimes I would hear, in fact I have said before, that you need the three diameters of straight inlet to allow the flow sensor to receive uh, and provide a, a more accurate signal. Now, as we've shifted in the industry toward uh, center averaging sensors, this has become less, less of a concern because the center averaging tends to take out this uh, ununiformity inside the, the velocity profile, giving you a, a more consistent signal. But we'll go back to one other thing. I'm more worried about sound right now, and if I have an uneven profile, if I have a velocity that's very high in one part of the ductwork, and I have an obstruction, be it a flow sensor or a damper, I have the potential to have uneven um, pressure drop, and pressure drop is related to noise. So if I want to minimize my noise generating potential, particularly lower frequency vortices off a flow sensor, I want to have as uniform a velocity of air hitting that unit as possible. So we're back to three diameters. That's the general guideline. Now, on inlet static, when we reach the point that I have more than two inches of static upstream, we, we start taking a concern because static pressure in that region typically becomes the dominant point of sound generation, particularly in a fan pair device. Now, uh, the units are typically certified at an inch and a half of inlet static on a fan pair product. Because at that level of static, the, it's felt that the, the valve sound generation is about equivalent to the fan. And so there's a contribution you'd be able to measure. When you get above that, you're definitely going to have the valve becoming more and more dominant. Now, I, I had an air handler uh, very close to a, uh, a set of terminal units in a hospital where they had, during their, their uh, engineering uh, redesign the contractor went through, he took the duct work up to a high-pressure system and we actually had close to six to seven inches of static at the inlets of these terminal units. And without liner, because it's a hospital, we had NC50. <laughs> that, that was an interesting experience. It would have been far preferable to not have that high aesthetic. Okay, so you got it. Now what are you going to do? Take a pressure drop in at least two steps, perhaps three, depending upon the situation. There's a, an additive effect on, on sound sources. As long as one sound source is 10 decibels lower than another across the frequencies, the lower sound pressure levels or sound power levels do not have an additive effect. The larger sound source is dominant. So, what I could do is, you know, for instance, drop an inch of static on the first damper. It may be just a fixed position damper, and then do my VAV approach on the second one. And I could easily end up dropping my pressure with no real amount of sound generation. Now, this is not an easy thing to to analyze. So, you, if you uh, feel that you need some guidance, we'd be more than willing to help you with this. Okay, this uh, last part of this presentation is really talking about a selection for a private boardroom. Now, uh, I encourage you to go to the Price HVAC Engineering Handbook. Um, this example is in that for the performance of this unit, of this room. Basically, it's um, an interior building height, uh, middle floor, <coughs> two exterior walls, a suspended ceiling, and whether you have a hallway outside of it or cubicle area will help you guide what type of a uh, terminal you're going to select. I know that static pressure is important, so I'm going to pick what I've been told by many is around mid-range on the statics. I've seen ranges anywhere from half an inch to an inch. I want to pick at 0.75 inches. On the discharge static, I've seen down around 0.05 to 0.25, but if I'm using an electric reheat unit, um, UL code says we need to have, for the certification of those electric heaters, we need to have at least 0.12 to 0.15 inches of static to make sure I have uniformity across the coils. So I always typically try to size and select at 0.15 inches. Now, I want to pick a fan box, so which one am I going to do? Which model? Um, if, and then, by the way, this is not an exhaustive selection of terminals. This is just two terminals. The standard, more of a commodity, constant volume terminal, and then a, an acoustically treated one, a more quiet constant volume. Not, not the quietest one you can get but what we would consider a good interim step. And you can see that at around half an inch of static, I have uh, NC30 radiated on the standard unit. At an inch, I have 33. So three quarters of an inch static drop would be around a 32 NC, which means that if my space goal is NC25, 
I would better off placing that terminal on the other side of the wall or over a closet rather than the uh, boardroom. Now, if I were limited on my uh, footprint that I had a, a need to put the terminal unit over the room, I could go to the quiet level box and meet my design goal fairly closely. Now, if I wanted to cut it down a little bit more, it's possible to do that on the radio sound, but we'd have to start adding attenuators or uh, silencers to the inlet of the return air, which is a possibility. So, as in a summary, we have um, Patrick who discussed the end reflection calculation being significant. And right now, of course, it's muddy waters because we have vendors that have the data and vendors that don't have the data. And until the end of the year, it may be actually more than a year away before we have uh, more consistent results being given to you on submittals. Just bear in mind that prices data has already been corrected. And one good rule that he discussed is making sure your data complies with the current standards. Your specification should list the current standards. If you need help with this or have some questions about those standards, by all means, let us know. And then Matt talked about flow rate and static pressure, and the lower of both leads to quieter selections. And oversizing may lead to stability problems and potentially louder sound levels. So right size your terminal, please. And then I just discussed location. It's important. Location is critical, and location may or may not break your job in terms of loud or not loud. I'm going to turn it back over to the moderator now. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Patrick and Matt, for your presentations today. We're now going to open up the presentation to the Q&A session. However, if you still have questions, please feel free to keep sending them in using your chat function or your question function there on your WebEx toolbar. First question is going to be for Jerry. Jerry, what software was shown in the slides for the performance calculation? That is the Price All-in-One Terminal Selection Program. It's part of the All-in-One software package that's downloadable on our website. Um, should you have an um, issue downloading it, by all means, please contact us. We'd be more than willing to help you with that. If you haven't used it before, we also can offer um, an application engineer to step through the process with you for your selections so that you feel comfortable with it. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Patrick, how does the return actuator affect the discharge sound levels? Well, turn attenuator on a, on a fan power box really will not affect the discharge sound levels. The, the return attenuator is on the inlet side of the fan and is really attenuating that inlet fan noise as well as any valve noise coming from the primary duct. So it really has negligible impact on the discharge sound. Uh, when you look at the occupied space, the combined discharge and return levels can affect the overall sound levels. Uh, so the two really are treated independently. All right, thank you, Patrick. Jerry, historically, our acoustical consultants have recommended that we add plus five NCs to the published acoustical data for terminal units to account for installed conditions. Since the new rating system accounts for end reflection, do you think this will reduce the need for this fudge factor? No. <laughs> uh, the reason I say that is I usually have heard that 10 NC is the recommendation. Five implies that the acoustician has great faith in the layout of the ductwork and the fitting process. Uh, I, I personally have seen um, a mixed bag on that in terms of field installations. So I, w I would still leave the five there as a pad, if you will, to help prevent any potential sound issues. All right. Thank you, Jerry. Patrick, will the change in end reflection most, most likely affect large or small sizes? End reflection, the inclusion of end reflection really affects more significantly the smaller sizes. And, and that was really demonstrated uh, by the ASHRAE funded research project that really showed or validated how large those uh, end reflection values can be for very small ductwork. Uh, so the, it, the net effect is that our smaller units are really much more greatly affected than the larger units. All right, thank you, Patrick. Jerry, for a single duct box, how does the addition of a reheat coil impact the required separation between terminal unit and the actuator? Attenuator, I'm sorry. Well, if we're providing 
uh, attenuator. An attenuator is a line ductwork section. If you're asking about a silencer, that's a configured device that has more sensitivity. So for the attenuator, the coil distance separation is not really an important item. We typically build the coil distance uh, into our housing so that we, we get a good uniform flow whenever possible. If we're putting a silencer on it, we would also pay attention to that. If we're field mounting the coil, that's a different question. I have no control over what the contractor might do. All right, thank you, Jerry. Jerry, another question for you. How can I tell I am looking at the latest and greatest data? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that the only really clean way to know is to first trust your person giving you the data, and second, make certain that they've calculated it correctly. Oftentimes, the footnotes will clearly tell you what methodology they used, and if you're part of the AHRI certification program, or a participant in that, you are required to put on your submittal information the date of the standard you're using and uh, so forth. So, you know, the foot, footnotes. But uh, that, that's a good question. And right now, we're going to get submittals back in from various vendors. They're going to have completely different bases right now. Thank you, Jerry. Patrick, how are the standards updated? Well, standards are typically updated by the governing body that issues them. So different different organizations such as AHRI, ASHRAE, ASTM, ISO, all publish standards and the standards are always periodically maintained and updated, uh, typically on a five-year cycle to ensure that the, that the, the uh, documents are an accurate, accurately reflect how products should be tested and to um, update any of the in inconsistencies that may be discovered in the implementation of these standards. So they're always a, a consensus-based document between a group of experts who meet and uh, discuss how the standards need to be modified and reflect current, uh, current changes. So AHRI is a trade organization, so a group of representatives from individual manufacturers meet periodically and uh, discuss how uh, any of the required changes that may be required for a, for a product uh, or for a, for a standard. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Jerry, for a balanced damper upstream of a terminal unit, I've always been told it is a no-no. Have you tested this application? In the real world, yes. Acts of desperation, perhaps, but... Uh, it's about the separation distance as to whether it's a no-no or not. If I were to place it fairly close to the flow sensor on the terminal unit and I did not have a center averaging sensor, yes, that would be a significant potential problem for you. But I have done it. Uh, I would prefer that we found some other solution before we went to that level of complexity, preferably lowering the static pressures. All right, thank you, Jerry. Patrick, is end reflection good or bad? One slide shows noise reduction with an end reflection. Another seems to show an air terminal having higher NC levels when end reflection is accounted for. Um, I guess considering end reflection is good or bad is kind of a, a subjective um, distinction. It, it's a real phenomenon, and it's really just what goes on in the ductwork. Um, in a lot of cases, it's can be considered quite beneficial and good if you're doing a duct analysis and you're trying to achieve uh, the sound level in the in a space and you can reflect reduce some of your low frequency attenuation that's required by uh, taking into account the end reflection at the termination of a duct uh, if you're on the equipment manufacturer side you're increasing the sound power levels at the low frequencies to af account for that um, sound energy that's being reflected into the ductwork. So it, it, it really is just a, a phenomenon that needs to be accounted for correctly in order to make sure that you have more accurate uh, acoustic analysis. So the part of the issue is that the end reflection was not being accounted for in the discharge side of the terminal unit and was being taken as a, a, an attenuation factor in the analysis or the um, 885 deductions, and so there's a, a, almost a, a double correction that could lead to um, a, 
op more optimistic uh, prediction of the net sound level in the occupied space. Thank you for clarifying that, Patrick. For our last question, we're going to address this to Jerry. Do you have an easy program to help with sound profiles before and after silencers? Um, easy program available in public domain? The answer is probably no. However, we are in the process of developing an acoustical lay-in tool that would be able to help you with that. Right now, our, our application specialists are using said software, but it's just not public domain yet. So uh, I am, I'm not honestly certain as to the release date on this, but I can put you in contact with three or four people fairly quickly via the phone that can help you step through this process. Thank you, Jerry. And for all of those questions that we were not able to address, we will um, have those provided for you in a Q&A transcript that we'll send out to you in a couple of weeks. A link for the PDH quiz will be emailed to you shortly. You'll also receive a recording of this webinar along with other resources within a week. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact Angeline Burks at angelineb at price-hvac.com. Um, upcoming, our next webinar will be in June. It will focus on energy efficient retrofits and will be advertised on pricehvac.com in the next few weeks. And that will conclude our webinar. Have a good day.